Okay, hello everyone. My name is Stephen Sheriff. I am the Events and Development Coordinator here at Glasgow Building Preservation Trust, which means I'm responsible for coordinating Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival. So just to let you know that this session is being recorded um, and I'm hoping that you can all see that slide there which says Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival. If anyone can let me know in the chat, that would be great. Um, I'd just like to thank you all for coming to this session in which I will set out GVPT's plans for the festival this year. So I'm going to start off by giving you an overview of the GVPT and G G Glasgow Joe's Open Days Festival, and then we'll go over to the various ways that you can participate in this festival. I'm just going to continue letting folks in as they arrive. Um, we'll then hear from Ingrid Shearer, who's going to introduce the festival theme, City in Flux. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how you can relate the festival theme to your own event. It's been two years since we've staged a full complement of Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival events. Um, and in 2020, the event was fully digital. And in 2021, we had our first hybrid model. And we learned a lot from these experiences. So we're going to be changing, uh, changing a few things to the festival format, um, and I'll go over these as well. Um, we'll then run through how to make submissions through the Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival website, um, and I'll highlight some resources. Um, and I will then hand over to you for a QA. and a So more folks joining us. Um, so Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival is organised by Glasgow Building Preservation Trust. Glasgow Building Preservation Trust is a charity that works to rescue, repair, restore and rehabilitate historic buildings at risk across the city. We work in partnership with others to give redundant buildings a new purpose and return them to their communities. Um, GBPT started 40 years ago this year in 1982 as the Bridgegate Trust to save the Brigget fish market, which was at the time threatened for demolition. Becoming Glasgow Building Preservation Trust in 1992, the trust has gone from strength to strength, rescuing, repairing and rehabilitating buildings across Glasgow and its work as a charitable property developer. Um, and here you can just see a few of GBPT's past projects. We've got the Calvin Grove bandstand here. And then on the next slide, you can see it uh, re regenerated along with Hutchison's Hall. One of my favorite projects is the police, pro police boxes, which you can see scattered about the city and the city center particularly. Um, this is White Vale Baths, which is a current project that we're working on with Peak Youth Theatre in the east end of the city. Um, and another current project is the West Boat House. Um, that's what it looked like when we started. Um, this was around this, this time last year. Um, and a more recent photograph um, sees the, the um, roof being finished off in the Boat House. It's planned to be finished um, in about September. So hopefully you'll be able to get a peek inside at Doors Open Days. Um, so where does the festival come in? In 1990, the then director of the Scottish Civic Trust, John Gerrard, had enjoyed door, Doors Open Days events in Europe whilst he was travelling, um, and he decided to bring the format to Scotland. Coordinated by GBPT, Glasgow and Air played host to the first ever Doors Open Days in Scotland as part of European Heritage Day scheme and the City of Culture celebrations. Um, starting with a host of historic and architecturally interesting buildings opening their doors to the public for free over a weekend, the event has now grown to include events and guided trails as well as an extensive digital offering developed over the last couple of years. Um, so Doors Open Days really is a fantastic way to um, celebrate the city's architecture, culture and heritage. Um, I'm just going to read over the mission here, which is to 
increase civic pride among Glaswegians and to broaden awareness of the city's rich built and cultural heritage at local, national and international levels. Um, and it's certainly true to say that the digital elements of our event have opened up new possibilities in reaching international audiences. Um, so Doors Open Days is Scotland's contribution to European Heritage Days, which takes place across Europe. It's coordinated nationally by the Scottish Civic Trust, and now every region in Scotland is taking part. Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival only exists due to the dedication and passion of all of you, um, the, the festival participants. So let's talk uh, a bit more about what it means to participate in Doors Open Days. It will be no surprise to you that um, the main element of the festival is opening buildings to the public. However, developments over the last couple of years have increased the number of ways that you can participate. Um, so you can open a building. Here we have Govan Old Church. The public loves getting to see into spaces that they don't normally get access to. Um, since 1990, we have opened the doors of over 500 of Glasgow's buildings. Um, and so it becomes more difficult each year to find new buildings to, the, to add to the programme. Um, there are three categories that you can participate in with an open building, and these different categories relate to the way that you at, um, open the building in terms of bookings, um, but we'll talk about a bit about this later on. Um, here we've got Emma at the Govan Stones, um, at Govan Old Church, giving her fantastic tour talking about the, the Govan Stones. Um, the challenge for participants is to offer a new insight into their building each year to keep the programme fresh. Um, this might be achieved by opening up a different space within the building or by putting on an event or um, an exhibition illuminating a lesser known part of its history. Um, and a great way to freshen up your programme is to consider creative activities that you can put on to help the public engage with your event. Um, another way that you can participate in the programme is by putting on an event, um, which is separate to an open building. Um, so on the slide here, you've got 60 steps. And last year, Jan and her team put on a fantastic street art event for kids. Um, and this is a really good example of using a creative activity to encourage folks to engage with the heritage. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the digital festival has opened up new ways to participate. And as well as in-person events, we now also have a digital events category. Digital events include webinars on Zoom and live tours on platforms like Facebook Live and Instagram Live. To name just a few, the Britannia Panopticon, Southern Necropolis, Mary Hill Bar Halls, Macintosh Queen's Cross Church, and uh, the aforementioned Govan Stones um, all have all read really successful live tours. Some of those with thousands of people tuning in um, across the world. So it's a really valuable opportunity. Um, the webinar programme has been highly praised by visitors and participants alike. And we've had lots of feedback um, Oh, there's someone else joining. We've had lots of feedback that people are really determined that it stays part of the programme and, and we also are determined to continue to provide this opportunity. Um, but we are of course also aware that where it can be safely achieved, uh, folks are really keen to get back to the festival hub where before the pandemic we traditionally held our talks programme. So we plan to offer the best of both worlds this year by live streaming all of the talks that take place at the Festival Hub. Um, so I would encourage anyone who would like to participate with a talk to submit in the in-person category and to give talk at the Festival Hub, um, because this will then be promoted as a digital event and it will increase your audience and create a legacy for your talk when it is added to the digital festival archive. Guided walks are now a staple of Glasgow's programme. We're very lucky to have so many people who are so keen to share their knowledge of the city. And on the slide here is a trail that was delivered um, in Springburn um, designed for children. During the lockdown of 2020, when we were not able to deliver trails in person, we came across an app called Guidego. Oops, skipped ahead. 
Um, Guide to Go is a fantastic way for you to create a heritage trail that can be downloaded time and time again. I mentioned earlier that the digital resources are going to be added to the Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival Archive. Um, and this archive is being developed in collaboration with the Education Department at Glasgow City Council. And they are going to be disseminating all of the resources that you create to schools across Glasgow. Um, I actually held a focus group with the education department just before Christmas and it was really encouraging to discover how much demand there is for resources about local heritage. Um, a, a focus that schools um, have at the moment is building a sense of place and creating a digital heritage trail is a really fantastic way to share stories about your local area. This year, we're going to be doing more to encourage visitors to make use of the digital trails. So we'll have um, uh, volunteers at our festival hub and we'll have, you know, a wee exhibition about all of the trails that are on, um, on offer and someone will be there to guide visitors through the app, show them how to download it. Um, so hopefully this year, those of you who have already submitted trails will enjoy um, a bit more attention on those. Um, and as well as digital trails and recordings of webinars, the digital archive is also going to contain films that have been made by our participants, like the one um, on the slide here made by Shireen and Lydia at Glasgow Artists Moving Image Studios and Open Past about the history of Govan Hill Picture House. Making films is a lot easier these days um, with mobile phones capable of shooting fantastic quality footage and free edit editing software readily available. Um, so if you are interested in making a film and um, you'd like some extra support, please do get in touch with me and I'll be happy to discuss your project with you and perhaps be able to join some dots. Um, now, in making plans to go forward, it's always good to have uh, a look back. So now just going to have a quick look at the festival of 2021. One last opportunity to show the trailer. Um, so Doors Open Days 21 was our first hybrid event. We had 160 listings, um, 8,629 people visited um, events in person, and we had around 6,000 um, digital visits on top of that. Um, we made a wee film to round up the event, and I'm just going to show that to you now. By learning the history of Glasgow, you actually fall in love with Glasgow more and you would be proud of being in Glasgow and you would be proud of being part of Glasgow. I love those open day. So it's really exciting that we were back doing tours again this year. It's so nice to come in, you feel the sunshine, you hear the children, you hear the people chatting. It's, it's lovely that, that we're back. People pass this building and you say to somebody outside, do you know where the panopticon is? No, I don't even know. Never heard of it until you show them. People come in and they fall in love with it and they don't want to leave it. It gives you a taste of what Glasgow was in its day and there's not that many places it's left like this. 
think that a lot of people don't know that this is the extent of the building. So giving people a tour of the building lets them connect with the building a little bit more. And obviously if you connect to the space and you feel closer to it and then you want to come and let your friends know that it's here. So it's basically a way of keeping the heritage alive. We're having a fabulous community open doors engagement day and it serves many purposes because people get to see a place they've never seen before and they get to explore their own creativity which is one of the most amazing things about it. People have been saying to me all day, oh we, I've walked past this building so many times I didn't even know what it was and they're really excited to hear about what's happening and what the plans are. So it gives us a chance to let them know what we're planning and it gives us a chance to meet people from the local area as well. I think people don't always explore their own city and I think Doors Open is fantastic for that. It makes people go out and just sort of know what's on their doorstep. The things that I found out about Glasgow, you know, living here all my life, even the thought that people come from all over the world, maybe just to see this church is an amazing thing. It's my favourite festival in the city, being able to access all these buildings in the, the city and being able to learn all of these hidden histories and other histories about the city as well. I think it's an incredibly important festival and long may it continue as far as I'm concerned. And with that, we're moving on to 2022. Um, every year we set a festival theme to help participants with planning their event. Uh, and I'm now going to hand over to Ingrid Shearer of Glasgow Building Preservation Trust, um, who is going to introduce our theme, City in Flux. Hey, hi everybody. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Yep, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, okay, so, I City in Flux, exploring um, change in the city, uh, how we how it comes about, how we cope with it, how we manage it. It's a really, really big theme, but it does give you a lot of scope to play with it. Um, I have to admit, I find it quite overwhelming, kind of trying to think around change, particularly at the moment. It's, um, it's very topical and it's very kind of on the nose. Um, so this is really just a kind of a few thoughts, um, some musings on how you might want to kind of tackle tackle the theme for your own um, buildings or, or projects. And I think um, one of the ways that you can go about this is, is trying to humanise change, particularly thinking about change in terms of human lifespans uh, and the changes that we see across our own lives, uh, that kind of short, medium and, and long term. Um, to be honest, I didn't have the capacity at the moment to, to think kind of beyond that scope. And I think it helps um, maybe some of your visitors and participants make sense of change if you can kind of think about it in a more kind of humane way um, and talk about those stories where change maybe had a positive outcome. It doesn't always have to be uh, a kind of negative thing. Um, and emphasizing those stories where individuals or communities have had some agency and, and made some of those uh, positive changes uh, or have, have managed and coped with change in, in different ways. Uh, those, are, those are stories that I think are, need to be heard, particularly at the moment. So there's a kind of, um, there's a natural churn uh, to the city, any city. They're densely populated, um, real estate's always kind of at a premium and you'll see different places and, and neighbourhoods become more and less desirable uh, over time. It shifts and evolves constantly. 
And uh, next slide, please, Stephen. So um, I'm not going to rehash some of those kind of big changes that we've seen in the in the city um, over its lifespan, because I think, to be honest, you'll, you'll know most of them already, and particularly you'll know the ones that have impacted on on the localities that you're working in. So um, yeah, we know big fires, two big fires in the 1600s, which um, you know raised about a third of the city. You know, you have the City Improvement Trust Act uh, and the impact of that in the 19th century, improved sanitation. You know, you have the M8 coming through. If you live in the East End, you've probably um, heard of the GEAR initiative in the 1970s. We have high rises new towns, new estates. Um, Glasgow has a lot of form when it comes to those kind of cycles of, of reinvention and we kind of um, kind of pride ourselves on it a little bit. Um, it'd be interesting to see how it contrasts with, with other cities. I, I've always kind of felt that Glasgow's gone for that kind of uh, tabula rasa approach and um, it's wipe the slate clean and start again and it just goes through these kind of endless cycles of, of reinvention. So there's, there's maybe something to play with there. Maybe it's, it's just in the DNA of the city. But ultimately, it kind of comes down to thinking about what do we value and hold on to from the past? You can't save everything. What do we discard? Who makes those decisions? And kind of on what basis? Um, next slide. Oh, sorry, there's some of the uh, City Improvement Trust Act um, tenements uh, up the high street there. Um, so if you're, if you're thinking about um, breaking it down, the idea of change into kind of more manageable pieces, um, you have those kind of sudden changes that, uh, that might need a, a really uh, immediate response. So if you think about fires, for instance, that's something that has to be dealt with straight away. Um, pandemics, again, very topical, big impact there. Um, but timescale wise, hopefully quite, quite short, but they have a big impact. Um, global conflict, um, you know, people coming back from, from war and the impact on kind of housing, refugees, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, oh, actually, next slide, Stephen. Uh, and then you have those kind of planned interventions that might last a, a decade or so. Um, so if you're thinking about the kind of new towns and the new suburbs, um, all those kind of uh, uh, demolition programs. So I've just put up, um, this is an image of the Calton here in 1932. And you can see there's a kind of slightly bald spot in the middle where they've just started clearing away some of the, uh, the old buildings there. I picked Calton because I think uh, a lot of people are quite familiar with uh, the redevelopment of places like Pollock Shaw's or the Gorbals and the works that went on in the sort of 50s, 60s and 70s. But actually, um, the Calton uh, was pretty much flattened in the 1930s. So just as a point of reference in the kind of towards the top right there, you can see St. Luke's Parish Church. You've got the Gallowgate uh, running down on the left-hand side of the image there. Uh, Glasgow Green over to the left, uh, just kind of poking in there, um, and Monteith Row before it was demolished. Um, and it's quite, it's pretty densely populated. So you've got a mix of housing and schools and other civic buildings and uh, little bits of kind of, um, lighter industry, so sort of textile related stuff. And then if we skip forward, um, it's a very different, <laughs> very different view. Um, St. James School, that's still there. Um, and obviously St. Luke's, but all that housing, this is actually the, the kind of second go of, of reinvention for the for Carlton. Um, because all those tenements and stuff were then subsequently knocked down and, uh, and new housing went in in the 1970s. But again, it's that kind of, that kind of turn. And so it's just kind of wide, wide scale uh, demolition that we tend to see in Glasgow. Um, 
Alongside that, you then have those kind of slow generational changes. So do you think about and maybe reflect on what you've seen across your own lifetime? Um, so road building um, would be one of those kind of longer term changes. Uh, and that's had a huge impact on the city and is still going on. Um, the other thing I wanted just to flag up um, was depopulation. I think when we tend, when we think about uh, Glasgow and change, um, we probably tend to think about that growth spurt in the 19th century. Uh, and you'll have seen the demographics charts, it just goes, it's a near vertus straight up. Um, and the kind of pressure that that put on the city. So you need new housing, but you also need um, to be thinking about kind of public sanitation. And a lot of that was also then in response to previous pandemics. Um, so call major cholera and typhus outbreaks in the 1830s, 40s and 50s. Um, a lot of that is what drove um, that kind of uh, street widening, tenement building, parks, public baths and steamies, all those kind of civic buildings that we see around. And um, that's driven by rapid industrialization, population expansion and, and public health. So <clears throat> um, you, you, you see that growth and expansion, but I think what's maybe less talked about is what happens after the Second World War, when essentially our, the population of the city almost halves, that's a massive change. And okay, it occurs over um, 30, 40 years, but um, probably the best description I ever heard was uh, Liz Davidson, who's a um, former director of GBPT, and she was, she was talking about what to do with a lot of these kind of redundant buildings. So you think about schools and, and churches and, they no, they no longer have uh, the community around them that, that used to use them. And she said, it's a, it's a bit like someone who's lost a lot of weight and their clothes don't fit anymore. Um, so thinking about that kind of uh, expansion and, and contraction in relation to, uh, to population. And the other thing that kind of struck me was um, those kind of 19th century big, massive, civic programs of house building and, uh, and you know, schools and churches and all, all these different buildings, um, they, were, they were in response to need, but they were also uh, an expression of, um, of civic wealth and civic pride and kind of showcasing Glasgow's um, manufacturing abilities. And you wonder now where, uh, how, how do we express our civic pride today? How is that kind of manifested? Um, so I was just gonna finish up. Uh, next slide, please, Stephen. I was just gonna finish up a little bit by, by picking a particular site and it, it's not a building, but it's got, as a, as a significant place in Glasgow, it's had a really kind of interesting trajectory. So um, if we accept that change is a constant and it is a natural part of our, our built environment um, and buildings and built features are, they're not always completely flattened, they are reused and adapted. That's a kind of natural thing too. We've been doing this for centuries and even millennia. Um, so uh, this is uh, Water Row and Govan looking over there towards the, the Riverside Museum. And uh, this is a particularly contested space. Uh, next slide, please, Stephen. So viewed from above, you've got Riverside Museum there um, on the Partick side and the Kelvin coming down. Um, you can see Govan Old Church there off to the left with that very distinctive kind of teardrop shaped graveyard. And where the car park is, that's, that's water roll. Um, so now by the magic of uh, screen grabs, we're going to travel back in time a thousand years. Uh, so this is, this is governed around about uh, a thousand AD. 
And you can see that teardrop shaped graveyard is, is still there um, and sitting opposite, kind of mirroring that shape is um, the Doomster Hill, um, which was this big ceremonial mound used by and associated with the uh, kings of Strathclyde. So they were used for sort of crowning ceremonies and that kind of thing. Um, and the royal palace was then a, across the river in Partick. Um, and you can see that kind of mound with the kind of step shape. It's quite distinctive. Um, in the 1840s, when the dye works occupied that site, um, the, the hillock, as it was known then, was still in existence. It had survived, well, uh, considerably longer than we first realised, um, because there's a, there's a note in there that they found a burial in that mound, which suggests that it's probably a Bronze Age barrow burial, probably dating back to 2000 BC or so. It's then reused as this big ceremonial site. Um, and then as a moot or a court hill during the medieval period, um, <clears throat> it's used then probably for kids to play on. They would have had, you know, sheep grazing on it and stuff. Um, and then the dye works stick a water tank in the top. By the 1860s, it's been flattened. The ditch is still there, but it's flattened and buried under a shipyard. And by 2022, it's a car park. So, there are plans for Water Row uh, in, at the moment, but one of the reasons that I picked that site in particular is, is because it's just alive with memory um, and generational memory. And there's, there's, there's practical reasons for certain places to become significant to, to communities. That one in particular is by a, a fording point in the river. Um, but there's also those kind of political, social, social and emotional reasons. And for, you know, uh, the Kings of Strathclyde or, you know, when it's reused in the medieval period, it's partly to do with kind of establishing your place in a, in a lineage and staking a claim to that place. Um, but it's all kind of wrapped up with that embedded memory of place. And uh, if you've gone along to any kind of... Um, community consultations over the last 10 years, you'll have heard people talking a lot about placemaking and the significance and the importance of place. Um, I would argue that there needs to be another layer on top of that, which is, uh, which is about time making. Um, places only have significance uh, because of the people that live or, or use those spaces. They don't have a, an innate kind of value and it's so that build up of, of memories and associations that, that give it the significance and, and value. So um, maybe when you're thinking about your own building, your own place, um, maybe dig, dig down a little bit and see how far back that goes and how that's uh, changed over time, um, how that kind of value and significance has evolved um, and what will, you know, how people kind of respond to it now. And um, yeah, I think, uh, I think there's a lot, a lot to play with there. Um, and for me anyway, I think the, the key to this is, is to try and, uh, try and keep it to a, a kind of human scale. Um, that's kind of my thoughts at the moment, but I'm sure they'll kind of evolve over the next couple of months uh, as they will do for you too. That's the plans for Water Row at the moment. I'm making no comment. Okay, thank you so much, Ingrid. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how uh, you might choose to relate the theme to, to your own space. So um, just a few ideas here. Some participants might choose to focus on heritage um, events or stories that have impacted or influenced the whole city. Um, so things like the 1780 opening of the Fourth and Clyde Canal or bringing, uh, bringing an era of prosperity for the city or the 1972 finishing of the M8 motorway, cutting the city in half and alienating thousands of people. Um, and these could emerge at, as talks at our festival hub um, or as guided heritage trails. 
Others might look closer to home and celebrate the changes that their organisations have made in their own communities, um, uh, such as the redevelopment of Castle Milk Stables by the Castleton Trust. Or perhaps um, the change you want to see is a more sustainable Glasgow and you'd like to open up a building that is making strides in green production. Or maybe you manage a heritage building that has an ingenious solution for en energy wastage. Um, maybe you want to give a talk or lead a trail about buildings that have disappeared from the, the Glasgow skyline. Um, or maybe you have a vision for an underutilized area of the city and you want to submit a short film on the subject. Um, if you are planning to participate with a building, we hope that thinking about the festival theme is going to help you to present the heritage of your building in a new light um, and perhaps also offer an opportunity to engage with new audiences. Um, the theme is set to inspire, to provide focus and to help with planning. Um, it is not compulsory. So if you're planning an event that goes in another direction, then of course, please do still submit. Um, there are two other themes that we are interested in supporting this year, and that is Visit Scotland's Year of Stories and European Heritage Days are also focusing on sustainable heritage, which is um, you know, what we looked at last year. So if, if you have still more content to, or you know, more stories to investigate from, from last year that you'd like to carry over, then again, please do submit these. We'd be really interested to continue, to continue those conversations. Um, there is currently some funding available from Visit Scotland for those wanting to engage in the Year of Stories theme. Um, the deadline on that is the 18th of March, and there's a link to that funding in the um, information booklet that I will um, point out at the end. Um, so I'm now going to talk a bit about some alterations to the festival format. Last year, we ran the in-person programme at the weekend only. Um, and this really helped us to focus the event. And we plan to do the same this year, but to include Friday in the weekend um, due to the fact that we do intend to have a much larger um, in-person programme this year than we did last year. The exception to this will be events at the Festival Hub, which will be running throughout the week. So in-person events at the Festival Hub and digital resources will run for the entire week, Monday to Sunday. Uh, digital events will run from Monday to Friday only, and there is an exception to this, in that if you're planning to give a talk at the Festival Hub, these will also be broadcast um, digitally, um, but online only content will be happening Monday to Friday only. Um, and then the rest of our programme will be running Friday to Sunday, and that's open buildings, in-person trails and in-person events. Um, the one caveat that we'll make at this point is that there's still some discussion as to whether we have the festival hub for the entire week. So it may be that um, later on we decide that the, that the entire programme is going to start from midweek, maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, um, but we'll just keep you posted on that. Um, so I just want to quickly run through the festival's aims, which are to increase the number of Glaswegians who are engaged in celebrating and learning about Glasgow's rich belt heritage, architecture and culture, to increase the profile of Glasgow as a destination for domestic and international tourists who are interested in history, heritage and the built environment. And as I mentioned earlier on, um, the new digital offerings are a really great way to, to um, engage in, in this aim. Um, and lastly, to provide public education and opportunities to stimulate discussion of current issues and design planning and preservation of heritage buildings. Submissions that are in line with our development goals will be given priority as we work to a more cohesive festival programme. So I'm just going to run through those goals. Um, events which are on theme will form part of 2022's central curated programme and may benefit from extra marketing support. Um, accessibility. In pursuit of our mission of being an open event for all, we are asking 2022 participants to pay particular attention to the accessibility of their building, interpretation material, walks and tours, and the talks. Um, and by this, we're not just referring to physical access, as we understand that historic buildings do not always lend themselves to this. Visit Scotland have a fantastic guide to accessible tourism. 
And that highlights many simple ways that you can improve access to your building or event, whether that means having information available in large print or making sure that um, things are well signposted. We and our volunteers will be taking part in Visit Scotland's free online accessible tourism training, something that we highly, highly recommend anyone who will be receiving visitors does too. And um, I will be linking to that also in that submissions booklet. Um, next up, children and young people. Encouraging children and young people to participate um, in the event and to attend the event is vital to the long-term success of our festival. Um, GBPT will have an intern wholly focused on this development goal in 2022. Um, and events which are in pursuit of this goal may be eligible for extra support. Um, under equality, diversity and inclusion, we are particularly interested in submissions from individuals and or organisations who consider themselves to be underrepresented. Um, and this includes, but is not limited to black, Asian, minority, ethnic, LGBTQI and disabled people. If you are part of an underrepresented community and would like extra help in realising your Doors Open Days event or by making your submission, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. Um, educational value, Doors Open Days, as you will all know, is renowned as an event where people can learn about heritage, architecture, new organisations and initiatives. Um, participants who can offer high quality educational experiences will be foregrounded in the programme and digital resources may be inducted into our digital archive, as we were talking about earlier on, um, and this will ensure a legacy for your content. Um, and lastly, just a note on relevance. Generally, the scope of the festival is broad. Um, submissions okay. which relate to built heritage, Scottish and Glaswegian history and culture will be welcome. Um, as we work to diversi diversify our festival audience and grow our arts programme, we welcome submissions that push the, push the envelope whilst also keeping an eye on our roots as a heritage um, and architecture culture event. <coughs> Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through some of these participant responsibilities. Um, stick to deadlines set by the coordinator. Deliver your event as detailed in your initial application. Communicate any changes. Display and then return promotional material. Report accurate visitor numbers and be aware of and use where appropriate resources such as risk assessments. And lots of resources are detailed in um, our event organizers handbook. Um, this year, all submissions are gonna be made through our website and you'll be able to sub submit in eight categories. Open buildings are, sep are separated into three categories which are no booking necessary, booking essential and booking optional. And just to say that buildings which do not require booking uh, in the no booking necessary category will be given priority as we work towards the most accessible event possible. Digital listings are also in three categories and these are events, resources and trails. And lastly, the in-person listings are in two categories, events and trails. Um, if you are in any doubt as to which um, category your event or activity falls into, please do get in touch with me and we can have a chat about your event beforehand, because if you enter in the wrong category, I will have to ask you to resubmit, which isn't too onerous, but I'd rather you didn't have to go to that, that trouble. Um, so in order to make your submission, you first have to register. Um, and to do this, you just have to navigate to the participate page on our website and click the register button and you'll then see the form which is on the right here. And you'll then be taken to the participant dashboard, which looks like this. So at the top, you can see three buttons, review submission, um, make a new submission and view resources. Clicking the new submission button will jump you down the page to the submissions forms. Um, and the resources button will jump you down to the resources where you can download the various booklets that we've got. Um, review submissions will allow you to view and alter any submissions that you have already made. Um, and in this little box here, there will be a tutorial video that will just take you through it step by step, um, just in case you need that. 
Um, so this is just to show you what the, um, the bottom of that page looks like. Um, and you can see here, you've got the different lists of the categories and it's up to you just to pick the category that your um, building or your event falls into. Um, and on the last one here, you can see the different resources that you can download from that page. Um, on the left, the participant submission information booklet details everything that we've gone through today. So the theme um, uh, and uh, the different categories um, and the event organizers handbook on the right has more general information about making the best out of your event with helpful tips. Um, and there's items in there with uh, risk assessments and stuff, things like that. So submissions are going to open this week um, and you will be notified by email when they do. Um, they are going to close on the 1st of April, so that's in a month's time. I mentioned earlier that you can log back onto the site and alter your submission at a later date. So if you are concerned that your event will change, not to worry, just best to submit now. Um, and then you can log in later and, and make a few changes. And I will be releasing another date, um, probably the big, towards the beginning of May, um, when that day, when you will no longer be able to log in and, and make further submissions. Because um, at that, that point, we'll be sharing the program with our designer and um, you know, starting to work on the, the festival brochure or um, map that's actually going to be this year rather than the brochure. Um, and that's all from me. Um, some dates up on the slide there. Um, but I'd now just like to take this opportunity to thank you all again for coming, um, to thank Ingrid, um, and just open the floor to any questions that you might have. Please also feel free to use the chat box and I can um, pick anything up there. There were a few questions that were Hi, asked. Hi, Stephen. Oh, got them. Hi. Hi. Uh, Rob Joe from Glasgow Gordura. Hey, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Thanks for uh, all the, the information you've just provided. Um, uh, we made a you know, video last year. Uh, I was just wondering if we can just use the same one. Uh, if we are, if you wanted to put it up, you know, digitally, and also uh, I made another one uh, for the educational purpose as well. So um, I'm not sure if I did send that to you. Um, so I can send that over to you as well to have a look if there's any changes. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, the the video that you sent last year will be in our digital archive, and we can certainly foreground that um, as part of the program this year as well. And yeah, if you have more videos, then absolutely we want, we want to see them. Uh, yeah. And uh, the one, the, the different video we made, it was that for the schools. Uh, when would that be? Because we do have tours around the year as well, like school tours. And it'll be handy for the schools to have that like in advanced, you know, because you'll probably have more um, right. resources to send it. Yeah, okay. So um, this year, our, as I mentioned, our intern is going to be working um, on bringing school groups, hopefully, to the festival. So perhaps um, we could just have a wee chat separately and talk about sure. the resource that you've got. Um, and then once the intern starts with us, um, she's going to be developing um, this project. So we're not exactly sure how it's going to work yet, but um, if there's any okay. resources that are going to aid her in that, then yeah, it'd be great to get hold of those as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question from Mary. Uh, hello. <coughs> um, in the site, um memorial thing for the for the, the martyrs for the radical wars uh, the last two years of course um i used the same video before that it was always in person and um, in 2020 as you remember we, we made a video of it and also 2021 just used the same video but now i would probably like to go back to being in person because i've expanded the talk quite a lot i did, I did the, I, 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 you know a much more expanded talk just a week or two ago to the the saltire society so I would like to probably use that and maybe video to, at the time. So um, would it be possible to, um, you know, have an in-person thing and, and go back to that, video it and maybe have the video in your archives or, or you know, accessible for 
later people who might want to see it um, who can't come along to the actual place? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, if you enter in the in-person category, then you can deliver uh -huh. the talk at the Festival Hub. Um, we'll record it there and then. Uh -huh. It'll also be yeah. live streamed. Um, and, and then at, thereafter, it'll be added to the archive. So that's All right. Good. Okay. So, so I would do that at the Hub. Yeah. And, and there would be facilities there for showing pictures in between because I had it as an illustrated talk. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay. Yeah, and if you want to enter with the, the trail as well, then yeah. And and then I would I would do the thing, um, do the actual in person thing in, in September when it comes to, uh, in the site. I could do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So, so so we'd have the video of it, and I could also go and do it in person, um, at the time. Uh, well, I mean, the, the in-person talk would be at the Festival Hub during the festival as oh, well, right. and then okay. your, um, the trail would obviously be on the festival weekend. Right, yeah, that, that's good, thanks. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Saha? Um, hi, so hi. Um, I'm, I'm having to, so we basically, I'm working with the University of Glasgow, um, and we're going to have like six interns from the University of Glasgow and they're not going to be trained up until the end of March. And I would ideally like them to do something for doors open days, like plan their own event um, in Glasgow, whatever that may be, either an in-person trail or like something digital. Um, and I don't know if I'll be able to make your deadline for the 1st of April and mm -hmm. um, your submission deadline. Um, that be slightly extended? Well, uh, as I said, see if you're able to put in uh, a submission at this stage, um, okay. just kind of outlining, you know, very broadly what your plan is. It then means that I've got a placeholder for it in the programme and the other right. um, like activities that we have to do to pull like or the coordination of the festival together can, can start. Um, and then we can go back and we can fill in some of the details. So it doesn't have to be anything indeed. Because I don't have a clue what they, they'd want to do or what type of event that they'd want to do. Um, and yeah. so yeah, just wanted to double check if that was fine for me. Just yeah, if you just add, add in something just now and then you know when these deadlines are always, you know, they always change a little bit. Um so just bear that in mind. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Hi there. Uh, so, uh, Garnet Hill Synagogue, uh, I think we will, we would like to participate in the in-person format, but we've also got a new um, heritage like walking trail, which I think we could maybe do as an in-person trail, which would be great. But I'm just interested, you mentioned um, that uh, uh, children and young people was one of your themes and you'd have uh, somebody who was supporting in that because I'd, I'd quite like to maybe have some kind of develop an activity that we could have for children and young uh, people when they were visiting the synagogue and I wondered if that's the kind of thing like maybe like some kind of sheet or kind of trail or something within the building is that the kind of thing that they would be able to help with? Um, I mean, as I said the the project's still to be kind of developed I, I, I've got an outline of how of what they might do and it might be like as exactly as you're you know asking uh, helping participants to create activities which should, could then be rolled out at various venues or it might be that we decide their their time is better spent actually facilitating school groups to the venues um, and so they're, they're going to be starting in a couple of weeks time um, so maybe um, if I, I'll just take a note and, and let to let her know that you're going to be interested in talking to her um, yeah. and maybe we can get together and have a chat about what would be really useful for you. Yeah, that, that would be great. I mean, it's not like it wouldn't be the be all and end all of the event that we were offering, but it could be a, a kind of a nice extra thing they could do if that was something that they were able to help out with. So that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Did anyone else have a question? Um, when you all signed up, there was a couple of people that wrote questions um, onto that forum, so I could run through some of those. Um, someone was asking about ways that you could uh, make a last minute change from in person to virtual, should the worst happen, let's not think about it. Um, but the, there's, there's ways to you know, develop what you've already made into a digital trail um, or a digital talk. Um, or you can um, create create a, a, power, a video essentially with PowerPoint, um, and that's a, a really 
you know, fairly simple way of, of pivoting um, to, to a digital format. Um, and then someone was asked, someone else was asking about timeframes. So obviously, 1st of April is our deadline at the moment. Um, just in, in April, early May, we'll probably have some guide go training for those of you that are interested in um, making a digital heritage trail. Uh, 1st of May, we've got our, we'll, around the 1st of May, I'm probably going to set the deadline for last um, changes to um, your online submissions. Again, there's likely to be some leeway in there. Uh, thereafter, we'll be looking at getting any photography done that you need. Um, and uh, then bookings opening the 1st of September. And before that, actually, the programme announced the 1st of August. So that kind of gives you a wee idea of, of what the next few months will look like. Oh, some questions in the chat here from Morag. Uh, do you know if there'll be a radio show element this year? And also assuming we could use third party to assist with video production. Um, so I think it's unlikely that there'll be a radio show this year. The radio show was actually the project of last year's intern. Um, and so this year the intern was as I said, it's going to have a slightly different focus. Um, that doesn't mean to say, though, if you created a podcast that so we couldn't showcase that in the, you know, in the festival and as part of the digital archive or something like that. So if it's something that you're interested in doing, then don't let the fact that we are not doing a dedicated one uh, deter you. Um, and as far as uh, using a third party to assist with video production, absolutely. Um, and on that, last year we worked with uh, Open Past. Um, and they supported quite a few participants to be making films and it might be that there's an opportunity for us to link participants up with Open Past again to make videos. So if that is something that interests you, then just do drop me a line. Are there any other questions? Nope. Okay, well, that's pretty good timing. We're bang on an hour. Um, it's good to see lots of familiar faces here. I'm looking forward to um, chatting to you all about your events. Um, I will be sending out an email in uh, the next day or two to announce that uh, submissions are open. Um, and that will also, that by that point, I'll also have done that little video that will be the how-to of how to use the website, just in case you need that extra help. Um, but also, if... Um, you know, there are any other questions, then always just get in touch with me um, and uh, I will be on hand to help you by email or by phone, whatever works for you. Um, someone to link the workbook. Yeah, I, I will I'll email the workbooks out, the, the um, information booklets out to you. Okay. Thank you all so much for coming. Looking forward to the Festival 2022. Thank you very much. I enjoyed Thank that today. You. It was very useful. Oh, thank you.